All right, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, so to start off with, uh, we are uh, over here on Lena E. We are currently running about almost close to 800 active A24s. Most of these are in the non-native, um, or sorry, the native with some into the edges of the non-native music for us on Lena E. Halle. So that means that most of our traps are um, up around 1800 to 3300 feet. Most of that is cloud forest, so it is fairly wet. Um, and then we do have about 80 traps that are coastal down at sea level near Hulapoi, which is on the south side of the island here. Um, and we're using these traps in a variety of ways at a couple different spacings, depending on where they are and depending on what the focal species we are trying to protect. Some of it is seabirds, um, some of it is native tree snails, some of it is plants, and some of it is trying to reduce rodents um, across the entire landscape. Um, we have bounced around in the past, depending on whether we were using static lures, regular um, ALPs or slug repellent ALPs. And we are currently now using what ends up being about a five to seven month check interval that is primarily focused around um, the Hawaiian petrel seabird season. Um, and so it allows it to go just a little bit later over the winter when there are not birds around. Um, but we don't want to let the rats come up too far because we have, again, snails and plants and other things that we're trying to protect. So in terms of resource response, um, we've got traps across such a wide area that, uh, H uh, that tracking tunnels have been challenging. And so we have been using our fairly extensive Hawaiian petrol monitoring program to be the sort of the indicator species to largely evaluate the effectiveness of rodent control. Um, you can see in 2016, there were very few A24s out of the landscape. Also, there was little cat control. So this is um, what you're seeing with the reproductive success increase in Hawaiian petrels going up about 195% over four years is a result of combined rodent control and cat control. Um, but if you do kind of narrow in on the failures that we can attribute to rats, and this was uh, largely from uh, nest monitoring cameras, so we can see the rats on camera, um, or sometimes get uh, what we would consider confirmation of finding a depredated um, egg or chick that is characteristic of rat depredation. We have seen those go uh, down corresponding to our uh, increasing levels of rodent control. So um, to talk about a little bit about the A24s, we just have one slide about CO2 and one slide about ALPs. I'm gonna throw it over to Christina. So this graph is going to break out our uh, A24 traps that uh, were without CO2 after a five month interval. We've broken it up by trap manufacturer year um, and traps were deployed um, roughly around the year they were manufactured. So 2017 traps were in 2017, 2016 traps were in 2016 and so forth. And this is over the last three checks um, prior to that, uh, our trap checks were not done all kind of in groups. They were a little bit more sporadic in different intervals. Uh, so we're using the last year and a half with the five month intervals to show how long our CO2 is lasting. Um, you can see that there's more traps with each check without CO2 as time's gone on. And there's more older traps without CO2. You can see that the 2012 2015 traps and the 2016 traps. Um, and by the, by the last check, it was over 80% of our traps had no CO2 at the five month interval. And we know that is not from them triggering 24 times and killing 24 rats. Um, but the 2017 traps, it's still over 80% of our traps that have CO2 after five months. And you can see that there is a um, trend starting um, similar to the 2016 and uh, older traps of CO2 sl uh, slowly failing in more traps with each check. Um, next slide. This is our uh, ALP persistence. And again, some things have changed um, in how we've done um, data collection. So we just have a comparison here between two different checks, um, both at five month intervals one with the regular uh, regular chocolate ALP and the other with the added slug deterrent. And you can see that um, between checks that the slug deterrent 
um, significantly increases the number of ALPs that still have bait in them uh, after five months, even in areas where we were not expecting it to be heavy, heavily sluggy, um, such as uh, all the way on the right here, uh, Hulapoi is our coastal area. And it's still not keeping as much bait as we'd like at Hulapoi, but something about the slug deterrent is making that bait last longer. Um, in all of our other areas on the hallway, it's um, at least 70% uh, have bait after five months when we use the slug deterrent. So the slug deterrent is um, definitely doing something um, for bait retention. Uh, going forward, we might shorten the hula boy checks um, a little bit because it doesn't seem to be lasting as long for hula boy, but our other sites seem to be um, doing okay at our five month check. All right, Tyler. Yeah, thanks, Christina and Rachel. Um, they did a good job of kind of laying this out of what I'm going to do. I'll just present my slides like they did. Um, for OENRP, we have about 1,400 traps right now, which is approximately 50 grids. Uh, those range from four traps at a site to over 300. Um, we're mainly in the Waianae, so a mainly non-native dominated music forest. And we do have some stuff in the Koalaos, which is a little wetter there. For this presentation, um, since I have so many traps and we, like Rachel has mentioned, we've varied our data collection over the years and with all the trials we've done. I'm just going to present the 2017 traps, which is almost 1100 for us, and only sites that have more than 50 traps at a site. This just shows how many we've had over the years. We started in 2013 with a small batch of them, and we've been increasing ever since. Um, yeah. So our resource response um, is hard to monitor, like uh, unlike Lanai's. So we use a independent monitoring system, which is tracking tunnels mostly for us. So I've uh, displayed two of our larger grids. Akahanui has over, it's a hundred hectare grid with 300 traps and Polykea is a hundred trap grid. And uh, this is the rodent tracking over percent activity over time for the last three years. Um, the green dotted line is kind of a 10% uh, goal of ours. And then you can see on the right that reference site, we quit running that in 2018 for a couple of reasons, but we're going to try to get that installed again. Um, but that reference site shows that rodents rat activity on Oahu is generally 40 to 100% if not controlled. And we're able to reduce it below 20% with the A24s. So how many of our traps are without CO2? Um, in 2018, uh, we had very low numbers without when we would go and check. And then it increased in 2019. And so right now of our 1,100 traps, about 50% of them are out of CO2 when we go. And the next slide, I will break it down by site. So these are those nine sites that have over 50 traps. Um, I kind of like seeing this because you can see some sites in 2000 and 2020 are near 80% or without CO2. And so that's pretty much the whole grid doesn't have it, whereas some sites are still functioning. Uh, and these are all from the same batch of traps. Um, yeah, what else can we talk about here? I think that's, that's good. And then, yeah, ALP persistence. So as Christina said, the slug repellent, that is something Good Nature is putting into the automatic lure pumps for us in New Zealand before shipping them over. So that is a good thing. We don't have to mix anything in there. Um, this is our information from our trial we did with the regular ALPs versus the slug, re slug repellent. This was a side-by-side -side trial for a year um, with a five-month check interval. And we did we defined it as if we could see that gas pouch is not visible in the opening of the LP, we kind of consider that bait remaining. So basically it was like a fingernail amount of bait. If, if it was anything less than that, then it wasn't uh, remaining. And you can see that at all of the sites, the slug, re slug repellent ALP uh, had longer persistence. So yeah. Hi folks, so I'm going to present a similar set of slides from our data on the Alakai 
plateau. We have been running two trap grids on the Alakai Plateau. The first um, grid at Halapakai was installed in 2015 with 150 traps. And after um, one year, we added 150 more traps to a total of 300 traps, which we ran for the next three years. But unfortunately, due to some of these issues that you, we've been talking about during this presentation, we are now back down to closer to 150 traps there. Uh, meanwhile, in 2018, we installed a 125 trap grid at Mohihi, which has been doing really well um, up until about now. We started experiencing our first issues now, and I'm going to go into that in more detail. Um, these traps are all in native forest bird habitat on Kauai, so 4,000 foot elevation, wet um, native montane forest. And at Halapaka, the, the grid is really regular, whereas over time we've, we've learned, and by the time we installed our Mohihi grid, we actually allow the spacing to vary so that it follows the terrain a little bit more, which makes checking traps a whole lot easier. Um, we, like Tyler, use track tunnels to measure the response of trapping. We do not monitor forest bird reproductive success at this point in time, although that's about to change. Um, we, since 2018, 15, we've had a control plot at Halapakai with 38 tunnels in it. And on the trapping area, we had um, 50 tunnels. This is the 2015, um, the 2015 grid, not the, not the later 2016 grid. Um, and so the blue bars represent rodent abundance on the control area where we're not trapping. And the orange bars represent where we do trap. Our rodent abundance is so low in general in that forest that we have to run tracking tunnels for three nights in order to get any tracks at all. So this, the levels of tracking you're seeing here are from three nights worth of data. We, we've trialed this over time and that's the best way to go for us. So it really is an index of relative rodent activity more so than abundance. But you can see that we've successfully with the A24s managed to keep that activity well, you know, mostly well below 20%. Um, and usually often by 10%. A whole bunch of things have happened in this area over the time we've been running the traps, including um, fencing of the area from 2016 to 2017 when all the ungulates were removed. Um, and then in the bar represented by the number three, we did run ALPs for a while, where while all the rest of the time we've run static lure um, in that area. And we've also been running an experiment where we raised the heights of traps to 50 centimeters over half of the traps instead of the standard 12 centimeters um, for, um, from the end of that bar representing number three to now. And then in 2014, uh, 20, early 2020, which, or late 2019, we changed the locations of all the track tunnels. But the amazing thing about, about this is that with all these changes we've thrown at the system, our tracking rates stay relatively constant. So it's fairly robust, despite all the issues we're about to talk about with the traps. So in late 2017, we did a trap check um, and noticed that almost all of the traps encased by the red, the red polygon, um, which are the 2015 era traps, uh, were failing. So I think two thirds of the trap were out of CO2 on that check. And they had been slowly running out of CO2, but we hadn't really paid attention until this sort of event two and a half years after they were installed when there was this kind of mass failure. Meanwhile, the traps that were a year younger um, out on those sort of fingers and thumbs coming um, off the main grid, which represent the 2016 area traps were experiencing more, you know, 10, 12% failure rates. However, the following year we, when those traps were two and a half to three years old, we got that same two thirds, 70% failure kind of rate of all of those on one whole check. So this problem of leaking CO2, which is the, what we're causing the, what we're calling failure, um, we, it's when you come up to a trap and it's just completely out of CO2, seems to accumulate over time. And in our case, because we know our rodent abundances are so low, we know it's not just because we're killing a ton of rats. It's really the traps are running out of CO2. Um, and similarly, 
at the Mohihi grid, the new Mohihi grid. So these are all traps that were installed in fall of 2018. So they're now just coming up on two years of, of age. We saw that they held in really well for the first year and a half of their life. And then on our recent checks, um, up to 50% of them have been without CO2. We, and this is at a four month check interval. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. All of, on average, our trap checks are um, every four months. We have been doing a lot of experimenting with our grids. So sometimes we check traps more often than that. Um, our latest issue, and we can talk about this in the discussion part of the talk, is we that Mohihi is unfenced and we have a major pig problem with the pigs um, knocking off the traps. So that's why we have been checking that grid so often lately. So to the issue of ALP persistence, I'm just going to use the Mohihi data because it's our cleanest and neatest data, even though we did run ALPs at Halapakai for a while. Um, so the bigger graph on the left with the blue bars represents our four months checks during the period of time that we ran um, ALPs at Mohihi. And because we were doing an experiment there, the number of traps with ALPs varied over time. So the little tiny numbers in the middle of the bar is the number of traps that had ALPs versus other kinds of lures. And then the axis is the percent that had lure remaining. And so sometimes after four months, almost all of the traps had lure remaining, but other times, as in July 2019 or February 2019, har hardly any of the traps still had lure remaining after four months. And the orange graph shows, because we're doing monthly checks for a while in the spring of 2019, shows that this change really happened from June 2019 to July 2019. It's that, it's that the, the lure hang in really well for the first couple of months and then it started to, uh, we started to run out of lure at some of the traps. And our vi version of, or our definition of lure remaining means the foil is not visible. So it can have a smear of um, lure over the top of it. At times it has meant that maybe half the foil is remaining. So part of the issue with our data is that we keep, we've been changing our definition a little bit about what remaining means. And I think that's it for me. So I think what we wanted to do is take some questions from you folks and, um, and then we can show you the survey data that you all helped us prepare. Um, and then maybe come like with a round table and talk about how widespread these issues are and what people are doing about them and et cetera. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so yeah, we have until um, 145 to take questions. Um, Lainey is also going to be helping man the chat here. Uh, so if you're just dropping your questions, um, Lainey also might chime in and help kind of direct the conversation. Um, and then yes, we can take a look at that data uh, that we collected yesterday too. Um, Kelly, can you talk a little bit about uh, what what you've talked to, to what what you've talked um, about with Good Nature and what their response has been? Sure, and I actually meant to go into that a bit in my talk. So, when those traps replace uh, at Halapakai, the twenty fifteen traps when um, failed sort of all at once, Good Nature was very generous and replaced the ones that failed very promptly. When the twenty sixteen traps failed, they asked us to send in a sample of the traps um, to examine them to try and figure out what might be the cause of the CO2 leaking out of them. And they, after examining them, said that there was no common cause. So they didn't feel very inclined to just replace them all because they thought maybe it was like user error, or who knows what. So since then, the conversation we've had with them, because I think all of us go into these relatively expensive trap, the A24, thinking we're going to get five or seven or whatever years worth of data out of them or activity or performance out of them. Um, Blair at, at the, North, the North American representative for automatic trap company has suggested that basically they replace them for us at cost. So they're not making money off them, but so we're, we're then they're calling these. So if the traps are within warranty, which is two years, um, they are being very generous about replacing the traps for free. And they're being very generous with their definition of warranty. It's not from the time you bought the trap, it's from the time you first put a CO2 into the trap. So 
some of the things we as a community need to start tracking are those kinds of things, like not just how old the trap is and its serial number and everything else, but when you first deployed it in the field so that you can get your full warranty out of it. Then if it's out of warranty, in other words, it's been two years since you've first put the CO2 into it, that they will replace them with this out of warranty trap, which is um, at, co the, at cost trap. They won't give you CO2 and they won't give you lure or black plates with it. They'll just give you the trap, but they will for $90 give you the trap. They do want you to send back all your traps when you use their warranty programs because they are trying to recycle all the plastic. So that's a really good thing that as they as a, you know, as a manufacturer are doing is being responsible for their plastic. Um, and so that has been very successful for us of helping us get our grids back up to speed because we were basically every new trap we were buying for the last couple of years was going into keeping our existing grids going rather than into expanding. Yeah, I would say we've had pretty much the same experience as Callie. I do want to note for everybody that uh, automatictrap.com is the new U.S. distributor, and that came on a couple years ago. So that might be a different um, a difference since when you purchase traps. So if you purchase traps from New Zealand back before Automatic Trap, um, those traps are obviously out of warranty now, and it's probably unlikely you'll be able to get any sort of assistance on those. So now we're all just going through Blair at um, automatictrap.com. And he really understands customer service. So it's been great. And so these, are, these data are data we have discussed with Good Nature. And they are as anxious as we are to try and figure out a solution for why the CO2 is running out. It doesn't do, suppose, so according to them, this doesn't happen in New Zealand. So, it, so we're trying to figure out how widespread is the problem in Hawaii. And you know, I've also reached out to international partners to find out if this is happening to other partners internationally. Um, you, you know, is there something about Hawaii's climate that makes it so that our, the rubber of our CO2 seals fails faster or something? That's one of the reasons why we did that survey with you guys. And I think, uh... Kelly, we had a question kind of about that, about the weather and things failing. Chris Warren said, are you servicing the traps or performing maintenance on the traps, cleaning, et cetera? Could submerging them in water be something else that's affecting the traps, the inner gaskets that are deteriorating? So we, um, as recommended by Good Nature, clean them with a bottle brush in the field um, to get rid of the old lure, but we don't do more than that in, until we pull a trap from the field and send it back to them. Um, I think Tyler maybe wants to talk about the big long drawn up process he went to through was at the gaskets because he had a very <laughs> exhaustive conversation with them about gaskets. Yeah, I guess to answer the question, Good Nature's recommended to us that we use an alcohol cloth to lightly wipe the insides of the trap and the outsides to kind of remove mold um, that's the only kind of servicing and maintenance we do on them when we get to them. Um, we don't submerge them or anything. I, I do want to note that we change the CO2 and the ALP every time at each checking interval. I know Rachel and Callie do the same, uh, just to let people know that we're not leaving CO2s in until they're completely out. We do change them every single time. Um, yeah, so... When we started getting these high numbers of traps that have failed, we worked with Good Nature and sent them 10 over to New Zealand to investigate. And the tilt valve seal is getting some sort of abrasion or cutting into the, the rubber component of it. Um, and so I've pulled another 40 traps and looked at those under the microscope and taken pictures and sent those to New Zealand. And they're working on it, but we don't know what's going on. We had suspected um, insects, cockroaches, but we don't we don't think that is the case anymore. And um, yeah, it's kind of a mystery because they were working so well for two years, um, and now half of them are failing. But as you can see, there's some variation, like. And in, with, even within Tyler's site, some of them are hanging in there, some of them aren't. And then um, Rachel and Le Christina are not observing quite that level of failure yet. So there is some variation. Um, I think um, 
that we've all realized though is it, we weren't, I don't think any of us were really collecting extensive data on how old traps were, how long each individual trap had been in the field or at a certain location. And going forward, that's something that we're definitely gonna be doing here because it makes it easier to see trends in failures, whether it has to do with manufacture year, because good nature, you know, they, I would imagine, are making minor improvements anytime they create new batches and as the years go on. Um, so it makes it easier to see if there's trends in failure based on manufacture year or how long a trap's been out or um, based on its location compared to other traps. So there's a lot more data we're going to be collecting going forward. So we can kind of try to find trends in uh, these issues. So I think that a lot of us, when we started trapping, were focused mostly on whether we were killing rats or not. You know, we were counting bodies underneath corpses and we were using counters and whatever we were doing. We were just, we weren't really worried about tracking data on individual traps because we just assumed that they would work as promised. <laughs> and so lately, I think our projects, forgive me if I'm speaking a turn, other projects on this panel, but I realized that we really do need to track trap individual trap performance to get our money's worth on these traps. Um, and I think that one of the questions I have is for this community is like, when I asked you in that survey, I, I put together that survey and we asked you a lot of questions about um, how much lure is remaining and is, is your trap at a CO2 or not? And the way you interpret that question might depend a lot on what your um, objective is or what your, what your mind frame is. If you're, if, you, if you're thinking solely about whether the trap is got lure in it, enough lure in it to attract a rat, you might answer a question about lure remaining differently than if you're trying to understand if your ALP is lasting the six months that the sticker says it will last so that you're getting your money worth out of spending the extra $3 on the, on the ALP. And so you, your data collection needs to reflect your, your, or your data collection needs to reflect your questions. Um, and so I think all of us are in the process of refining that data collection because the nature of our questions is changing over time. And I think um, one of the things I have noticed also is um, when we say things like ALPs or statics are quote lasting three months or four months or six months, um, I'm also one of the biggest things I am interested in is whether, for instance, static lures, whether they are lasting without being touched. Like, you're not touching them for five months and do, do they still have, have lure? Because if they're, if they're getting visited every month and being able to sort of tapped out, like tap out the hard, um, the hardened bait or lure moldy stuff, that absolutely makes sense to me that they last, um, that they could last longer than ALPs if you're visiting them monthly. The only way that we are able to run the grid of, you know, of like 800 traps that we are running right now and some of the locations we are running it is because we are not visiting it. Um, other than twice a year, we would we would not be able to do it, and we we haven't seen anything close to five months with um, static lures, and so we we stopped using them wholesale. But we have seen a major difference, like major, between um, the regular ALPs and the slug repellent ALPs. Again, like Christina said, even in places where we didn't think we really had slugs. Um, that has made the difference where we probably would be doing a three or four month check and we do feel comfortable doing a five to five and a half or six month interval right now because we are still seeing fresh rats under A24s and lure remaining um, after that time period. So I think some of these things really do uh, matter when you're thinking about lure. Like if you have the opportunity to visit your traps like monthly, it probably isn't worth the extra money to to use ALPs. Um, so there's, there is a lot, there's a lot of subtlety in, in the kind of, uh, when we say things like lures is, is lasting X amount of time. For sure. Thanks, thanks Rachel. I just want to jump in here. The uh, chat is kind of going off too. So Lainey, did you see any questions in the chat that you think would be relevant to pivot um, towards? Yeah. So uh, Rogelio had some questions about um, tracking tunnel um, track track nights um, and I think I think that got addressed it seems like the it varies between one and three nights depending on the site and the activity levels um, but I, I feel like as long as you're consistent across your you know monitoring period you, you, you can adjust that to whatever you you know think is works for you um, it, to how people is that what people feel 
I recommend the, te the test that like Chris Warren did and like we did. Mm -hmm. So check at one and then, but leave them out and then check them again at three and comp so you have both sets of data. Yeah, when we first did it, we did it at one, two and three days. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, if you don't know much about your rats, that's the way you're gonna find out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I totally see that, Callie. I just think we then can't compare ours to yours very easily. And I know the New Zealand BMPs are one night and then that's how they compare across their country. So just keep that in mind. I know I yeah. know you have a unique situation, but. Right, I mean, it, we just, we can't, we can't use that metric if all the, the plates have fewer than 10% tracks. So we had, you know, we understand that limitation. I'd say for what it's worth, uh, what I was talking about is our Nakula site. Um, once we started trapping, our rat prevalence dropped from like 8% to zero, even though we were still catching rat so i i almost think that we might have should have done three nights but we just had so many mice you could have never seen it so you know there's other reasons to use different nights um but i think for the rats it probably would have been better to do three um if we could still see their tracks that is mm -hmm. all right um, I, I pre all right go ahead Oh, I was well. I was going to move on to another question, but if you if you're still discussing tracking tunnels, go ahead. Um, just one thing, you know. Uh, I appreciate this this conversation we're all having. Uh, that's something that I I've always wanted to bring to the table. I know, you know, Tyler, you've been extremely helpful through the years. But one of the things I always wondered is, it's so hard to be able to compare when we're doing sort of different methodology, like many other, you know, science uh, projects that happen. So like, you know, I, I almost wished if there was any way we were a little bit more consistent where we could really have the apples to apples conversation in regards to spacing. I know at PTA, right, we're dry land forest, upper elevations. And, uh, you know, I talk a lot with Andre and kind of um, share what we're seeing. And I guess at PTA, you know, we're definitely noticing um, three nights is what gives us a much better sense of what's out there. You know, I've done pilot studies where mice and rats actually don't show up till night three. And I know if I would have, if I would have stayed with one night, my data would have looked very different. And then also for spacing, I know at PTA with our endangered plants, 50 meters appears not to, you know, have an impact where I'm seeing uh, rodent densities uh, declining. So it's more like I, if there was any way in the future we had some forum where we could maybe reach out and say, hey, I'm using these techniques, I'm using these techniques, and maybe that's where we could compare a little bit, a little bit better. This is Eric. I'd just like to say one quick thing um, uh, about the frequency of tracking tunnels. Um, or the, or the duration. In general, we, we try to do just one night just so it's consistent. The only exception to that is if our main goal is just to know if there's anything inside a fence or in a certain area. Like if we think we've totally eradicated rats, but we wanna be sure, we might leave the cards out for several days or even a week. We wanna know if there's anything inside. That's really the one exception that we do to the, the one night. So Laura had a question a while back, not about tracking tunnels. Are we? Should we, we, do you want to talk more about tracking tunnels or do you want to get into some of the other issues? Yeah, let me talk about Laura's question. I'll try to address that as best as I can because I've had a good relationship with Good Nature in New Zealand and I've reached out to them multiple times about this to see if people in New Zealand are having the same experiences that we're having. Um, I've also reached out to Craig Gillies. He is with the Department of Conservation. He's independent of Good Nature. He's done a lot of research on A24s. Um, and I recently reached out to him and um, some of the trap, he doesn't have any traps from this 2017 batch. He does from 2014 though. And those traps are still in the field and still functioning. So um, don't really know what to say there. You know, that's kind of the response we get every time we go there. It, 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 it seems to be working in New Zealand. So yeah. it, that's why we talk, Callie and Rachel and I have been talking, why is it not working here, you know? 
Um, and so I reached out to some international listservs that I'm on and asked if anybody else was using them at this kind of scale we're using them at so they would you know have some solid data and nobody responded. Um, so. we're getting we're getting a lot of questions in the in the chat which is great. Um, I'm going to try to kind of summarize it because I, th I think some of the some things were already kind of resolved. Um, there was a question about the ACE hardware traps. Um, if you don't know, there's some some um, good nature products are sold at ACE Hardwares. You can go on the automatic trap website to check to see where, which ACE um, has them in stock. So if you're you know out of a if you just want you know just a couple of products, you can possibly go down to your local ACE Hardware and uh, pick them up rather than have to wait for them to be shipped out. Um, but those are those are the same. They're coming from an automatic trap. So they're the same product as you would get from automatic trap company. Um, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Cause I think some people are not, are not aware of that when it could be kind of useful. Um, there were some questions about uh, cleaning. Um, there's a question about other cartridges, aluminum or sorry, aluminum or steel. Um, uh, can someone? Or steel. Or steel. Okay. Um, there was some questions about cleaning. I think Chris had, a, I think we discussed that. Um, and Tyler talked about how good night to recommend uh, using alcohol wipes. Um, and then has anyone set up a control trap not in the field to see if the CO2 runs out? I think you were trying that out, Callie, is that right? Yeah, we responded on the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see now. I know Kyle and Alex on Kauai have done something similar. And okay. I don't know if they're on the call. Um, so, yeah. I just yeah, also want to quickly make a comment about what automatic trap does and does not have available these days. So people are not surprised. Mm -hmm. So because so much of their market now is the, are people who want to run them around their barns or their homes or, or whatever, um, they are carrying them in the hardware stores and they are really, really focused on the automatic lure pump. So everyone should just be aware that if you want to buy anything other than an automatic lure pump, like static, or if you want to buy this slug repellent lure, you need to give them lots of lure time because it's no longer part of their static manufacturing. And, and the citric, standard manufacturing. So the citric lure, you have to order a minimum of a thousand um, which is not always easy, obviously, for smaller projects. Um, so we recently put together, we had to pull five, four or five different DOFAR projects ordered together to try and get to reach that thousand uh, minimum for a Citric ALP order. Um, and then, yeah, like Callie mentioned, the static lure bottles are no longer stocked by automatic trap. So we had, so they'll still sell them to us, but we need a lot more lead time because they have to order them from good nature and have them shipped to automatic traps and then have, and then they can fill, you know, fill our order. So make sure you, yeah, for both of those things, make sure you plan well ahead. So do you guys want to take a look at your responses? Oh, Rachel, sorry. I was gonna, Kelly, you had mentioned um, just before we completely leave it, the question of sort of whether people outside of Hawaii are having this problem and, and why they seem to be lasting a really long time in New Zealand. Um, there is someone who's uh, he on now who is from um, Guayanas National uh, Reserve in Canada in Haida Gwaii. And they have been having similar problems with CO2 running out more quickly than they would expect as well, which I thought was very interesting given that I would think that the sort of the climate um, off British Columbia and the climate in New Zealand is that sort of that wet coastal rainforest type habitat is sort of similar. But again, Tyler, you said that New Zealand, they seem to be lasting for well more than three years without starting to lose CO2 every time. Yeah, and there was a question about how long we could expect them to last. And from what I'm hearing from Craig Gillies and from Good Nature is five years. Um, I know there's something else we could discuss. Um, we've been working with Blair to try to get a five-year warranty on them or some sort of five-year replacement plan. And so just to let everybody know that's something we're working on with him. 
I asked the person from Guayanas to join. I, I connected him with Peter to try and have yeah, him. Uh, Suzanne, here, she's Suzanne, she should be on. She was talking about, uh, she said, we have lubed the diaphragm with silicon lube. It helped for four months until now. Tried it only on 10 traps, so it's statistically not too sound of an experiment. Uh, Suzanne, can you hear us? Do you want to talk on that? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> So, Hello. Oh, hi. Do you, do you, sorry, I did not uh, pick up on your question. You were broken up. Oh, sorry about that. We were just commenting on your comment in the chat about lubing the diaphragm with silicon lube and how it helps for four months. Do you want to speak on that? Um, yeah, I've uh, done that about a little bit longer than four months ago. And um, I've checked on them last week and the 10 that I had put out in the elements, they still had charge um, and they were leaky before. So uh, there's those screws at the end of that cap where the CO2 cartridge goes in and you can unscrew it. And then there's a diaphragm. And when you take it apart, you see already where loop has been before. And that's where we looped it over with silicone loop and it uh, worked so far. Has anyone else tried this? I think that Kyle and Alex do that. Am I right, Justin? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's at the diaphragm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we did that in 2014 and 2015. Um, good nature doesn't think our current 2017 traps are leaking CO2 from that component. It's, may, it's believed to be from the tilt valve seal right now. So are there other causes of failure? I mean, I guess occasionally, but may, may, mainly the CO2 leaking has been the issue, right? Yeah, I think that's what, like what, like Tyler said, there are, we have a list of, and that we've kind of gotten from Tyler and our own experience of some major things that you can have, or like you, you screw in CO2, you do the test fire and all, you just start hearing hissing, just going everywhere like that's a, a catastrophic uh, and obvious failure there are sometimes where you can really tell that like when you uh come up and go to fire it there's nothing when you try it again um it does fire like or you get a weak strike first and that is also indicating that there are some seals leaking around the chamber that's powering the uh the piston and those we are ones that we've been pulling and we always replace. But I think what Callie and Tyler and I have all, all been realizing is that um, there is this pattern of where when we go back and look at the data, there's individual traps, individual pieces of equipment that just every single time, there's nothing that appears to be wrong with them. But as every single time you go at four months or five months or six months, they're just, they have no CO2. They're just empty. Um, and we have, were able to go back and actually look at like the last three checks of um, some of our specific traps. And so that's, that's where I think all of us are realizing that there's a percentage of the traps that some of them you know, may perform correctly for four to five years, but there's a, a lot that after about two or three years, that individual trap isn't gonna look like anything is wrong, but it's running out of CO2 way faster than, than we all expect them to. So maybe we should look quickly at the date because I mean we're not the only most projects seem to be reporting this from the from the survey, right? Maybe we should we, look at just that. just before you do that, Kelly. Um, I just want to make sure we've um, addressed the. There's a couple uh, quick questions. Um, uh, Kim was was asking about, uh, about if has anyone looked at geckos as a possible um, source of the problem. We yeah. don't have geckos at our site. <laughs> we have, we do have some geckos at some of our sites. Um, where we're experiencing the leakage is at the tilt valve seal, which is inside um, by the leaf trigger. Um, 
I think I have seen gecko eggs in there before in the mouse shroud. That's the little protective thing around the leaf trigger. Um, so unfortunately, the gap between the plastic and the rubber is only about one millimeter. So I don't think geckos are um, having any sort of impact on that. Um, but it's something we, sh we will definitely keep our eye out for. OK, and then finally, there's there's been a lot of discussion. I think it's been resolved about um, question or questions about recycling the CO2 canisters. Um, it looks like some islands have that option and unfortunately some islands don't. Um, so I guess it's it's yeah, obviously, if you if you can recycle them uh, on your island, that's great. But if you can't, it's unfortunately uh, goes to the trash. Um, but I think that's it for the questions. If you want to go ahead with your uh, survey results, Kelly. Sure. Can you see or no? Did it share? Should yeah, say it. Okay. it will. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it will. Yeah, it's loading. Okay. Whoa. There you guys are. Okay. So um, since we're running out of time, um, I will go through this quite quickly. Um, thank you, everybody, for responding at such short notice. I uh, just wanted this very first slide just shows you the kind of gamut of um, size of projects we have um, with most people running um, fewer than 300 traps, but obviously some mega projects running more. Um, a lot of people have come to Good Natures in just the last two or four years. Um, and then down here in the bottom left, Nobody except I think Tyler and um, Rachel and Christina check traps less often than every four months. Although I do believe that Halix on Kauai does, they're just not on this, they didn't respond to the survey. So the vast majority of people are checking traps very often, um, less than every two months. So for those people, um, the ALPs might not make a lot of sense because you can just walk up to your trap and squeeze the chocolate out of your um, thing. Um, all elevations were represented. Most people are working in primary, primarily in native wet forest, although there's a smattering of people working in other habitats. Most projects are using either static chocolate or the ALP chocolate and not all the other lures available on the market. Pig issues were rare, which I'm happy to hear, and I hope none of you guys have the pig issues that we've had. Um, and then tunnels and cameras were the most popular monitoring tools with only 14% of us able to monitor the actual resource response. Um, how do I click to the next? Okay, so across all of the, the projects that were running more than 50 traps, and I, and I chose that just because I wanted to have sort of a decent sample size of traps being evaluated, um, no projects uh, with traps if, that are either more than two years old or less than two years old reported that they had CO2 remaining after 50%. So it seems like the, the problem is pretty um, ubiquitous that everyone is finding that their traps are running out of CO2 after four months or Alec, can you, many. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. So we kind of standardized our data and how we collect it. And we know that each other, that we change out the CO2 every four months or five months. I don't know if everybody on these have the same standards. And I think it just points back to the best management practices and how it'd be great if all of us could be doing something similar so we could compare data. Um, right. But yeah, we'll go, through, it's fine to go through these. So I think that Tyler's point is if you're, if you're leaving your CO2 in there until it runs out because you don't want to buy CO2 all the time, then obviously a fair number of your traps are not going to have CO2 when you get to them. Or if you have a lot of, which is my last point, if you have a lot of rodents um, in your area, you might be actually maxing out your trap, which I do think happens in some areas. But yeah, this is something for us as a community to discuss. Like, do If we think that CO2 failures are a big issue and we want to be trying to get to the bottom of this issue, um, then maybe we all need to think about changing out our CO2 every single time um, or so that we have a better handle on this if that's not happening. And then um, why is it not wanting to advance? There we go. Um, so again, lure persistence. Um, this is the projects reporting some ALP lure left after four months. And earlier on, in the day, uh, 
there was a thread of conversation when, in one of the other talks that maybe this is an elevation effect. So I broke this down by the elevations that you reported on and it doesn't really matter what elevation you're at. Um, most people are reporting that after four months, half, half of traps or fewer have lure remaining in them, even though good nature says it should last for six months. Now, again, if you're not changing out your lure every single time, then that could be a factor in our data collection. Um, we, you know, you should change out your lure every single time. Notably, not in the table, there were two projects with fewer than 50 traps at high elevation that had a lot of lure remaining. So that's interesting because some of us were wondering if the high, the, high, the pressure at elevation meant that the um, lure ex expanded faster and was forcing the lure out faster. So that's not necessarily the case. Um, meanwhile, at lower elevations, people are worrying that their lure is melting too fast and just dripping out of the pouch. And then of course, back to our kind of community-wide issue, we have to make sure we're rating lure remaining at the same time, in the same way. So I think, um, I don't, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time and make sure we have time for discussion. A lot of other issues were reported, slugs, ants, um, rodents damaging traps, empty or rotten bait, um, what to do when you have a sudden fluctuation in rodents, like do you have to maintain, maintain your traps more often? So a whole bunch of things that we as a community are facing and, and I liked what Rogelio, I think it was said, like maybe we need to have more than an hour devoted to coming up with standards and best management practices for this community. Um, so just in conclusion, we need to think about the kinds of data we might wanna collect for these issues. And back to what I said earlier, it to some degree it depends on whether your issue is just you wanna kill as many rats as possible or whether you also wanted to, to document whether your traps are holding up to the lifespan you expect from them. And so there's a lot of small text there, but I think we don't really have time to go into that if people wanna talk or chime in um, about, about um, the data in general. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, we've got about five minutes remaining. Uh, but we are we are going to take a like a fifteen minute break after that. So again, I can leave it running, and then but at two o'clock is the hard deadline. We're going to start uh, Patrick Chi's uh, presentation. We had a question in the chat come up about um, a question about could the emissions from volcanoes cause cause gasket failure. I have no idea. Any I mean, volcanologists got any insight I mean, on that? I guess, I mean, if there's a lot, right? Because part of this is like the volcano was make things more acidic and could that be part of the reason why rubber deteriorates faster here than in New Zealand? Maybe. <laughs> Worth asking good nature, I guess. New Zealand does have some volcanic activity as well. True. <laughs> I don't know if they've got Kilauea belching all the time, though. Uh, they had a pretty horrific uh, eruption a year ago. Um, that's, that's my background right here. It's pretty appropriate, huh? There you go. I took that from a helicopter. Yeah, it's, I guess we, it's this question we could uh, pose to them about what the, the effects of uh, volcanic emissions could be on the product. Yeah, Callie, something you said too made me think. Um, so our slug deterrent lure, we also thought that that may be contributing. So we looked back at the data and um, no, it, it doesn't appear because I did a side-by-side -side trial for one year with all traps. So we have a real large sample size of like 3000. And um, no, the, the traps were failing at equal rates even if they had the slug deterrent lure or the regular ALP, so. I just what wanted to, variable? sorry, go ahead, Kelly. No, you go ahead. I was just reading the last question, but you chip, chime in before we go to the next question. Oh, I was just going to reemphasize that if you want, if you're interested in ALPs, but you, you're you worried about them not lasting, that if you, if you haven't tried the slug repellent, you really should, um, because it did make a significant difference across our sites for how long the ALPs were persisting. That's all I had. Well, I guess quickly on a follow-up for that, 
um, KFERP is about to go into a four-way trial of static citric, static slug, static regular, static uh, ALP slug, ALP regular to look at capture rates or kill rates. So we're gonna be running that over the next year at 200 odd traps at Halapakai, so stay tuned. Um, we had a question from Brett. This is kind of a, you know, a good uh, summary question. What would you recommend for data variables to keep track of? Callie, you mentioned a couple. Um, do you guys wanna comment on that? Um, I think what we weren't tracking before that we're gonna be tracking going forward, um, your trap manufacturer year and also um, first deployment date of a trap. So you know exactly how long that trap's been out in the field. Um, and we change our CO2 every time, but if you're not, I mean, keeping track of how, how long you're going between your CO2 changes. Right, like we, we used to not, and we had a counter, we have counters on our traps. So we had a rule that if you got to 15 counter changes, you needed to change out the CO2. So we can manage the differences in data and practices about changing CO2 out or not. Um, if people have an additional metric that lets us know how, how long their CO2 has been there. Or even if you decide you're in a rule, you always change it in your January check or just something like we can, as a group, we could analyze the data, but I think it's better practice to just change it out. It just makes all the data collection cleaner and neater. All right, Rachel Kelly, Christina Tyler, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Can I, I say one more? Yes. Um, so we order quite a bit of the slug repellent lure. So if other programs, there was a question about that. If, if you're having a hard time getting it because you can't make the minimum number, we can probably figure something out, so. Thanks, Tyler. And I'm happy to stay on and talk about more metrics and stuff. I think a key one for us is the lure, this lure remaining issue, if we wanna understand the, the ALP performance. Um, so I'm happy to stay on if people want to, um, I'm, it's fine. Yeah, if, I, I, so I would also, yeah, think, um, I would also recommend if, if anyone would like to um, talk about what their definition of lure remaining is, that could be helpful. Okay, I'll keep it running then. Um, but uh, just letting everyone know that in uh, at two o'clock, we're gonna transition over to um, cat control for conservation, an important topic. Thanks, Ben. Thank you everybody. Thanks for tuning in and thank you for doing the survey. All right, so who's still here? I have a question for you guys. This yeah. is John, better. Uh, not about lure remaining, but given what you were saying, and if the traps are only going to last two years, at what point have you guys reconsidered using A24s and going back to snap traps? Um, if they're cheaper and you know you can get a put out a grid and you know they're going to work, and I mean there, at some point there's a cost benefit analysis, right? Where A24s, if they're not going to last, are just going to be are just too expensive. So I think it guys, depends on your your grid size. I mean, we couldn't run 800 snap traps um, across our our sites. Like it, it wouldn't be manageable. Um, and so if we can work out something with good nature where we're getting them replaced on a regular basis or getting them for cheaper um, within a certain number of years, to me, the good nature is still um, time-wise. We, we simply couldn't run that many traps. And I want to point out too that like when we check these traps three times a year, every four months. Um, when we get there, you know, that the, there's often a dead rat underneath a trap that's failed and there's maybe like, you know, there's no, um, but there's no CO2 left in it. But like, it, it's not like, I, I think that the majority of the time in that four months had a working functioning trap there. And so you're still get like, that's I think what we haven't really tested yet is kind of what proportion of time are we trapping versus not trapping Kind of on the landscape when we have them, but I think it's still well above fifty percent of the uh, of the time in that interval, even though they're failing by the four month mark. Well, we have a little bit of data on that from the twenty sixteen traps yeah. that we pulled because yeah. we we went oh, yeah. we did go back to them after we decided 
after our unfortunate incident with birds a couple of years ago, we decided to close the grid and we went back after only two and a half months and everything that had had no CO2 at four months still had two, CO2 at two and a half months. Yeah. So it's, it's, the at trap is better than no trap. And our, all of our um, tracking data, Tyler's and mine, and then Rachel's and Christina's um, burrow data show that the traps are working despite all these problems. Um, but you're right, John, at some point, the cost benefit side of it is like, how much money do you want to throw at this? Um, I have two thoughts on that. One is where I could, I would go for aerial broadcast before I went back to snap traps. Um, I think. And because the cost, Tyler did a cost benefit analysis in, on it and aerial broadcast comes out being cheaper if good natures have to be replaced very often. Yeah, John, we can talk to more offline, but um, I did publish um, a cost benefit analysis recently and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, the Army, we're in the fortunate position that we ran over 2000 snap traps before we went to A24s. So we kind of knew how much that cost. And um, so we were able to do a pretty good analysis. Um, I'm pretty sure it's right at two years, two to 2.5 years is the break is the break point between victors for us and A24s. Um, so well, that's why, yes, uh, we're definitely thinking about it. And that's why we're getting with Blair to try to get a five year uh, mm -hmm. replacement or warranty um, because yeah, it'll obviously be much better, but um, I can pass you that info. But the other thing is, is that I came across a model, and it's not empirical data, it's a model that suggests that if you have low rodent densities, like we do, or in some places, you might as well run snap traps and self-resetting traps, and you, and you don't go back to the snap traps any more often. You just have enough of them across the landscape that the chances that a, a rodent runs into a snap trap are pretty high. Um, the, the only key there would be figuring out a, a, a lure for a snap trap that lasts a long time so that by four months you still have an attractive trap. So or I'm, I'm something the slugs in that won't model. eat. That? <laughs> or something the slugs won't eat, right? <laughs> right. Um, you guys pro pro probably talked about, if he's still on uh, Hiko, I was just on their website and ended up over on D2K website and they have a lot of interesting snap trap baits that um, are reported to not mold. Um, they last two to three months, you don't have to change them. So that could be, they're sort of hard tabs. Um, they're not an actual food, um, but they work as a trap den. So you guys might wanna check some of those out. So I am, can we, uh, I am curious if people want to talk about it, about how people are defining, like a trapping out of CO2 means it doesn't pass a test fire. So, I mean, that's a fairly easy one, but lure is, seems like it's a lot more subjective. And we had a, quite a few responses about lure from the survey. So I am curious to hear what people are calling, saying if an ALP has lure or not, how do people define that? Or a static of like, what, what like, do you, yeah, what do you consider good lure remaining in a static? If you're comparing that with ALP as well. Uh, Kelly, if I if I can see the uh, foil in the ALP when I look straight in at it, that's then I say there's not much left. Or if it's like just around the rim, there's some brown. But if I see that shininess, I I replace it. Um, if I may digress, uh, one quick point. Uh, Brett was kind of getting at this earlier, but um, you know I appreciate this talk and guidance for what metrics to take care of because we just. Uh, Yesterday, I think found out that we are getting one of these C swigs. Uh, Tyler, you remember uh, from HCC a couple of years ago, I was talking to you about putting in a, a big grid. So it looks like we're gonna, we're funded to do this 400 trap grid in a Kipuka here on Big Island. Wow, um, congrats. <clears throat> yeah, so we're putting 400 of these good natures out, you know, uh, uh, from scratch now. Uh, I already have a bunch out in other places, but uh, you know, I'd love to, make sure we're recording all the things that uh, you guys have come across that uh, um, I'd, ra I'd rather get it right from the beginning on, on this batch than uh, wish I had recorded later. So hopefully these ne this, hopefully in 2021, good natures last a little better longer than two years. 
right? Yeah, I think definitely we should chat. Um, the most important thing we've kind of been discussing is the minute you go to a trap and it's out of CO2, we're now taking that trap out of the field and sending it back and getting it replaced under warranty. You mm -hmm. know, in the past, we'd always have some low level five to 10% of traps that would be out of CO2 and we wouldn't do anything with them. And then the next time they would, they would have CO2. And then the next time they may not have CO2, but now it's anytime we get to a trap without CO2, it's gone. So we're carrying replacements with us. Same. Um, okay. Kylie, you, you took, you, you mentioned the, um, out of warranty replace, like, uh, replacement, um, that automatic traps are doing. Do you, do you know if that's for everybody or is that, is that just a deal with, with you have, with, or I guess I have with, um, automatic traps or does anyone who's buying from automatic traps have that option? I think anyone who buys in the kinds of quantities we do, what you are using that, aren't you Tyler? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you are buying a handful of traps, I'm not sure, mm. but. Okay. I just wanted to double check on that. Thanks. And I think, I mean, I think some of that is a little bit of a, of a is a holdover as Tyler said, um, Blair at, at Automatic Trap has been trying to talk with us and, and with good nature to try to get a little bit more into the, the source of some of these problems and, and is kind of trying to work out a bit of a, of a warranty or, or other types of situ uh, deals or plans that one could be on. I mean, I know that for some people, they just need to be able to buy when they can. For others of us, like if I could replace, you know, I would be willing to say, yeah, I'll replace 20% of my traps each year, which would be a five-year replacement, as long as you also replace any other, any trap that is out of CO2 whenever we go visit it. Um, as long as we're again, I, I don't I don't expect them these things to last forever, um, and it is a little bit rough on the budget if you need to replace like two or three hundred at a or four hundred five hundred at a time. Like if our whole grid fails and we have eight hundred traps, like we can't we can't we just can't right. either physically or financially deal with that. Right. Um, yeah. Right, which we, I think is why we've we started. Just, we did just get enough out of warranty replacements to try to replace all of our. 2016 and older so we will still have a large 2017 batch and some 20 a small probably less than 120 or less than 50 2018 and 19s um, and then we will hopefully get new ones because we're trying to get onto a better replacement schedule right but that's why replacing them on under the warranty program within that two years is key because then you just absolutely that, yeah that part is just getting chipped away at all the time so I mean, Blair and I think Good Nature both, ATC and Good Nature both see us big conservation product projects in Hawaii as huge ambassadors for their product across the United States. They're using us to sell their product and they want it to have a good image. So if we're unhappy and we're complaining and having meetings like this, they're worried and they're trying to make amends however they can. Yeah. I had a quick question for you guys. So, um, you know, we're protecting the banner of storm petrol here at PTA. So part of my requirement is I got to do carcass collections of A24, you know, rodents uh, every two weeks. That's because one, um, we do, you know, we have observed barn owls in our area. Um, in addition, you know, we also feel, you know, possibly we could be luring um, additional predators you know, we do have a, a, a cat trap line as well, but um, am I the only, are we the only one here that's doing carcass collections or are or, or any of you having that requirement put on you guys as well? I know Alex, um, Kyle and Alex do extensive carcass searches, but Christina, who used to work for them, I think it was only like just, just when you visited them like every four months. And you, yeah, and, and then you just chuck them, them away. They, we don't collect them. We didn't collect them then. Yeah, I think Callie lose, uses counters and the rest of us uh, either use, are using more independent monitoring. Um, like at some point it does, you can kill a ton or not very many, and that doesn't necessarily tell you whether you're killing enough to protect the resource. And so just how many you kill is a, I would caution 
about using that to make any determinations about the impact you're having on the resources. We just published, we're just publishing a paper in that same journal, Rogelio, about the impact of the scavenging community on corpses below the traps and how reliable that metric might be, but also just how, to, how fast to anticipate that it might get scavenged, because you're asking also, you're, I think your program is worried about what scavengers you're attracting. And the answer is a whole variety, including birds um, that come and sca scavenge the maggots off of the carcasses. Um, so in a fenced area where there are no pigs, most of your carcasses will remain. And if you want to use that as a metric, you can have a fairly reliable metric of how your activity at your traps. But in an unfenced area where there's lots of pigs, fewer than 50% of the carcasses remain after a few weeks. I believe the uh, Allah Law project had that requirement. Uh, my project mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah, yeah because uh, Allah Law might scavenge. Yeah. I'm not sure if Jackie or Kule are on, but yeah, they, they had to remove the carcasses per in, be, because of the alala. So it's two, you guys. Oh, it's the we're pumpkins now. Um, so we should say goodbye, but thank you, everybody. That was really great to get your input. And maybe we can organize something like this for a, a couple hour session to hammer out some definitions and stuff. Tyler, Tyler, I forgot. Did you want to explain really quickly um, what I'm going to send about the listserv that you talked about yesterday? Or should I just do that in the email? Yeah, if you're not on the list serve that we made for the last predator control hui, um, Peter's going to send a link that you can uh, subscribe if you want to. And yeah, so we also have a Facebook for that okay, same cool. group. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, look for after this session, maybe tomorrow, I'm going to send out the uh, kind of post uh, wrap up. So look for that. I'll put that information in that email. Great. Thanks, folks. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, so moving right along, uh, we have a really exciting uh, conversation. I'm going to stop the recording here. Heads up, everybody.